Welcome everyone. My name is Iram Karaba, project writer at LEARN, the local engagement refugee research network. And you're listening to our first ever podcast episode. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that this land on which I reside, located in Toronto, known as Toronto. It is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and I am grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Okay. I am honored to be joined today by Professor Dr. Marsha Schenk, Kate Reed, and Ismail Al Khatib, uh, editors and contributors of the newly published book, Right to Research Historical Narratives by Refugee and Global South Researchers, published by McEwen University Press. Hi, everyone. Uh, before we dig into this amazing book, I would like to give our audience a chance to get to know you and get to know a little bit more about your professional interest. So could you please tell me more about yourself, your personal journey in academia, your professional interests? Sure. Good morning. Thanks so much for having us. I'm very excited that we have this opportunity to have a conversation together today. Um, yeah, so my name is Masia Schenk. I am based at the University of Potsdam, which is just outside of Berlin in Germany. I'm originally German myself, so I'm originally from Wuppertal, which is a city in North Rhine-Westphalia, but I've also been very privileged to be very mobile with the German passport that I have. Um, and so I studied uh, in the United States, in Switzerland, and in the UK. Um, I later worked in Argentina and Indonesia, and I've been able to do research um, across different African countries, Angola, Mozambique, Namibia, South Africa, and Ethiopia. So um, all of that has really instilled an interest in global history for me, and that's what I'm doing today. Um, I work on connections and entanglements, but also on disconnects between places, um, and mostly these are in Africa and connected to elsewhere. Um, I just said that I've been mobile myself for work and for education, and these are exactly the two themes that I looked at historically for my PhD. I looked at labor migration and education migration of Angolans and Mozambicans who traveled to East Germany um, at the time of socialism to get an education and get work experience um, in East Germany. And so that has instilled an interest in me in different forms of mobility, something that I'm now continuing with a research project that is specifically focusing on displacement and how the organization of African unity um, came to see the so-called refugee. Um, currently, I'm based in Munich, so I'm talking to you from Munich at the Historische Kolleg, which is an institute of advanced studies, and I can pursue the second book project from here, for which I'm also very thankful. So that's it from me. Well, thank you for that, and we're excited to hear more about your second project. That is very exciting. Uh, Kate, over to you. Great, thank you so much. It's also an honor and a pleasure to be here with you all this morning. My name is Kate Reed. I'm currently a first year PhD student at the University of Chicago. Um, my work is mostly on Southern and Southeastern Mexico where I look at the impacts of industrial development, uh, specifically railroads on gender divisions of labor in the early to mid 20th century. Um, and yeah, I, I met Marcia, I first met Marcia um, in 2019 when we worked together on an oral history course, um, which turned into this book. And so it's really fantastic to be here with Marcia and with Ismael, um, who was a student in that course and now is a very valuable and valued contributor. Um, so yeah, so I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Kate. Um, Ismail. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us. Uh, I'm really happy to be uh, joining this conversation um, with you. Um, so my name is Ismail. Uh, I am originally Syrian. I live in, uh, in France. Um, uh, academically, I have a master's degree in uh, translation. And, um, and acad academically, I made a shift to, to study social science in, in Paris. Apart from that, I was uh, involved since uh, the beginning of the Syrian conflict in the domain of society support with a focus on um, women's, uh, uh, women's rights. 
And um, this basically was the motive, uh, the motive for you know choosing this um, choosing this uh, uh, topic to contribute to the um, to, to the to the book. I had the privilege to to work along with uh, Kate and Dr. Marcia on on you know setting the frame to to conduct this um, history project and to uh, to contribute to um, to the um, to the oral history as uh, as an experience. Thank you. Um, can I ask you how did you get involved with global history course? Yeah, definitely. So, um, so I was uh, I was in science school uh, in Paris, and uh, we got invited as uh, partners with the uh, University of uh, Princeton to uh, to have a course on global history. And then uh, we had the idea to participate in the global history dialogue uh, and look at the ethics and uh, the um, the research methodologies and to conduct our research on uh, in this uh, in this framework and then i was invited by dr uh, marcia and uh, kay to contribute to the book that's amazing that is a fun amazing course i wish i i had known that um so let's start with the book uh, the book is an oral history research conducted by those who are closest to forced migration um can i ask you how did you, all of you, become interested in this field? Yeah, sure. Um, so I was first involved actually doing a lot of solidarity and immigrant rights work in New Jersey um, on the East Coast of the US where I was in university at the time. Um, and that sort of turned into a, to a position working in, as an assistant teacher for an English as a second language adaptation of the global history course that Ismail mentioned um, for local high schoolers who were mostly migrants from Guatemala and Mexico. Um, and from there, Jeremy and Marcia asked if I would be interested in working as a teaching assistant for the oral history research methods course that Ismail also just mentioned. Um, and that ended up for me being such a formative experience for thinking about the intersection of historical scholarship with my existing political commitments to address the kinds of inequalities that are both that both stem from and are exacerbated by borders and bordering. So that's kind of how I came to the project. That's amazing. Um, Marcia, could you tell me more about the global history course and also how you became interested in forced migration field? I know you mentioned mobility and that is definitely seen in the book as well. So over to you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I guess now I can tell about the uh, genesis of the Global History Dialogues project, which is the course that both Ismail and Kate have already been mentioning. Um, so in 2016, I first went to Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya. Um, I was a teaching assistant at the time for a course taught by Professor Jeremy Edelman at Princeton University, and that was a straight up um, global history course called the Global History or the History of the World 1500 to the Present. And I was teaching this course to my students, and we started talking about the absence of themes such as migration, but specifically forced migration, the absence of the theme, but also the absence of voices of scholars with a displaced background in the production of what we were reading and learning about um, global history at the time. And so that got us thinking about designing a course that could specifically sort of set out to address that lack of voice. Um, by providing the training in a methodology that is accessible to everybody, no matter where they're placed, which is oral history, providing training and analysis of sources, and providing training also in storytelling and narration, and therefore sort of setting people up, giving them the tools to actually focus on their own research questions, and then do the research, develop the archives that they need to answer their question, and then actually also tell the story to the world, whether that's in a student conference, which is what everybody does in the course, or publishing it on a blog post, which is also now what everybody does, or even taking it further, such as the contributors in this edited volume or in this anthology, they've taken their research even further to develop it into a full length book chapter. Um, so the, the impetus really stems from this conversation that I had with my students many years ago in which we noticed an absence and a silence and a lack of something, which we then sort of thought 
um, how we might address that. That's very really interesting that the seeds of this book were, um, it started in 2016. It's been a long way and it is definitely amazing. Um, so Ismail, over to you. Sure. Uh, I mean, like my interest comes from beyond the academic uh, framework. Uh, working on the, um, let's say, having like firsthand experience with, uh, with the, you know, the student uh, crisis context and working with women. I have been always concerned that uh, women who could struggle the socioeconomic uh, oppression uh, would would have their accounts overlooked, like learning from from different stories, learning from my community. I, I belong to uh, a small minority that uh, like a lot of accounts of the real accounts have been overlooked. So I was always concerned that the accounts of individuals, like of women, would be um, would be forgotten. And after all this comes to an end, the only story, the only narrative would remain is the uh, the Australian uh, story, their version. So I've been always like trying to note down and uh, document their stories. Um, so this uh, concerned like was manifested when I, uh, when I uh, participated in the, uh, in the course of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the world to history, when we were asked to, um, uh, to conduct case studies and what we think about certain like changes in the history. So I was thinking like probably if I mention or add the, the, the voices of those who were normally marginalized, that's this would diversify the understanding of the of the of the experience. At the same time, it would give another meaning. It would um, it would enhance the understanding of people, and and this is what we see in like normally in the context of uh, displaced people that often their um, their the the sense of agency is missed. They're not being granted the the platform to speak for themselves. So normally the narratives are being constructed by scholars, uh, you know, and their role in the story is being overlooked. So I, I didn't want that to, to happen. And I said like, probably I can use this opportunity to see where I can go. And, uh, you know, luckily I've been, you know, I've been able to, to, to participate in a small chapter that I'm very proud of. Yeah, that's amazing. That is very true in terms of giving autonomy and agency to the people who are displaced. Um, then my next question would be the title. So that is a nod to a Padurai's essay on right to research. And you kind of expand on that. And you mentioned that citizenship should be taken out as a criteria to conduct research. And this also re relates to Ismail's chapter because citizenship is usually co constructed on a male patriarchal basis, right? So how do you how do you think citizenship problematizes how we conduct researches, how do we do oral history, archives, and in terms of this book, of course, yeah. Sure. Um, I think I'm going to start framing this question from sort of the history as a discipline, history as or historiography as a discipline at a university, because the very history of history itself is one that is intimately tied to the nation state. Um, so history for a really long time has been sort of a discipline that helps in state making and installing a sense of citizenship in people by providing a certain narrative about what a state does and how it came to be. And so for a really long time, these kinds of very nation centric histories have missed everything else that took place outside of the nation state. And migration and mobilities by definition take place outside also of nation states. So this nation state centric framework has been actually very central not only to history but also for instance 
um, disciplines such as migration studies, where for a long time you would also see um, studies that would focus on migrants once they have arrived in a certain country um, and then only examine their lives in that certain country, but not what came before or what comes after with this very linear assumption of migration from A to B. Um, and then um, global history, for instance, is actually one of those ways in which you kind of seek to break down this focus on nation states only. And you ask specifically, how does how do things um, take place that are connected between nations? Um, or do we see sort of comparative things? So like, for instance, if we take revolutions, there have been revolutions in many nations. Um, if we compare them, what can we learn? These kinds of questions to get sort of outside of that very limited box of um, of the national history. And so if we take that to migration studies also, we can sort of look at circular migrations, we can look at any form of nonlinear migrations, we can look at multiple, multiple migrations in one person's lifetime, we can look at sort of a continuum between forced and voluntary migration. So we really can see many more things once we take out the sort of very narrow focus on the nation state. And I think for us in this book, it was really important to acknowledge that it's not just important um, for citizens to be able to engage in research to be more informed citizens, which is a very important argument and one that Apodura makes, but that it is also crucially important and perhaps even more so in contexts where you're very, very vulnerable because you're actually living between states. You may be stateless, you may be in different forms of displacement. And again, the ability to inquire into um, questions and analyze and find information you need in, sort, in short to do research becomes very, very empowering and crucially important, especially in those um, contexts. So I think I'll leave it here and um, give the two others, Kate and Isma, um, some chance to also contribute to this question. Thank you for that. That that was an amazing start. Kate, would you like to respond, add on? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I think following on everything that Marcia said, that our approach really complements and extends Apodurai's conception of the right to research um, by thinking not only about what the right to research does in the relationship between, in his case, a citizen and a state, um, but also in thinking about research as a conversation that involves other people who are doing research and other people who are engaging in processes of inquiry into the circumstances that surround them. Um, so, so one of the things that we're trying to think about with this book is what it takes to realize a right to research outside of a nation state citizen context. Um, and I think that on the one hand, that's an epistemological challenge in, in taking um, individuals who for various reasons have not been understood to be historians because they don't have access to archives or libraries. They're not inside the academy. They're not scholars in some traditional sense. Um, and also a real material challenge precisely because um, they don't have access to archives or libraries or databases or all of the things that um, that historians working within the academy and specifically the Global North um, Academy take for granted as kind of preconditions to be able to do historical research in the first instance. And so it was sort of addressing those challenges, but also thinking, okay, on the part of those of us who already consider ourselves to be inside research as a conversation, what are the obligations incumbent upon us to take seriously knowledge that's produced from contexts of displacement, that's produced as oral histories in conversation with communities that have been displaced or that are in processes of displacement? Um, so I think our kind of provocation and extension of Apodura's argument is, is thinking about that other side of the right to research as well as how do we take seriously what it means to transform research in order to take all of that knowledge that's produced in refugee camps in context of displacement by migrant researchers um, as seriously and as part of conversations that are ongoing. So I think that for, for us has been a really big part of the conversation as well. Ismail, I'll pass to you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kate. I, I totally agree. And I can drag from the book itself where what what Marcia has mentioned, and probably I can uh, I can uh, paraphrase it in my own words, that 
the 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 the, co the question that the book is trying to tackle is that for a long time the refugees or people who are concerned with the displacement e experience were treated as objects of 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 study in isolation of their societies so there is no regard there's no um consideration of the the heritage they're bringing along to their host communities so the question here is how to, you know, between two brackets, how to decolonize this experience, how to decolonize the, the process of understanding the people's um, experience and what they are bringing to their, to their uh, host, uh, host communities. And part of it is that to give uh, the role to, um, to the first-hand experience people to narrate their version of this story, meaning not only depending on incidents, on certain reports, but also to add the human feelings and the, um, let's say, to, to add empathy to, to, the, to, the, to the narrative. Because this is what makes the, um, you know, the narrative inclusive. We are trying to, to, to have inclusive history at the end of the day. Another challenge that probably like the, the book was trying to tackle is that people who consider themselves as refugees or, or displaced are being product of, um, let's say, a process of, let me say, Western culture and media that is portraying refugees or displaced people as um, victims, regardless of their um, of their experience, they're not being treated as actors. Um, so probably the chance that this book is trying to, to give is that chance to, to be the narrator and to add a critical contribution to the, to the narrative. So I think like in, in so many ways, like as a prototype, this book could, could tackle, you know, probably like scratch the surface of that, but like, it's a good start. Yeah, thank you for that. I definitely, I read some of parts of the book <laughs> and there's definitely that sense of switch where um, refugees and people with this uh, displacement, for displacement background are acting rather than being acted upon. So there is that centering of that figure. And I, I truly appreciate that. And it is one unconventional method, that's for sure. Um, you also, another unconventional method that I found in the book is that all of you, you address the reader in the beginning of your chapters. Ismail, you start with dear reader, um, editors. You also start with saying, we know our positionalities. We know where we come from. And here's what we try to do. So. Can can you tell me more about your unconventional methods? What drove you to talk directly to the reader? Yeah, yes, definitely. Probably, like, as as you mentioned, I know that I was vulnerable in many, so, so many ways that I am attached to this context. So the, my interviewees like are women from my context. I saw their 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 hardships. Um, so I can't claim to be uh, fully objective. At the same time, I know that I was tackling like different eras of history that I wasn't there. I didn't know like the it wasn't documented, so I, I don't have access to material to prove like those incidents are, are right. At the same time, like much of the conversation, if you if you um, if you saw that that it it involves a lot of feelings and emotions, um, which is as someone who's like uh, you know uh, disciplined in research would consider as a flow you know like to uh, to include uh, human feelings in in a research um, so i tried as much as possible to consider like to consider that i am taking those sample i'm taking two examples of women who come from specific uh, era 
they represent specific communities. They don't represent the, the whole spect spectrum of, uh, of women in Syria. I know their experience might be subjective in so many ways, but they are witness of development. And as I'm researching in, in a very problematic question, meaning the, uh, the development of gender awareness, which is still problematic nowadays, I know there will be a lot of controversy controversy on questions like, you know, the question I, I, I was hesitant to ask about abortion. I know it's very, very problematic to ask that. And I know like the, the interviewees will, will be uncomfortable like addressing this question. Try as, as much as possible to, to leave the space for them to talk, to express themselves, to express what they saw, how they perceive it, rather than like, um, you know, telling them what to say and what not to say. So, um, so yeah, this is, this is, was my, this was my concern from the beginning and it was manifested throughout the process of, of the conversation. And when I came to, to writing, I made sure that I document their feelings as much as possible to translate them from the Syrian dialect to, uh, to English. Uh, and to be, uh, you know, uh, to be as loyal as possible to to their accounts. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you can definitely get that sense of emotionality at times, um, and I appreciate that. Uh, Marcia, would you like to talk more about your own conventional methods? Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that is really important to us in this book is to make the conditions of production, and here I'm using Michel Rovtreyot's term, the conditions of production of history as visible to the reader as possible, because often when we read sort of straight up conventional, say, edited volumes, um, the process of research has disappeared. We see the end product. Um, but given that we have an amazing group of contributors who come from places um, or live in places such as France, Syria, Iraqi Kurdistan, Rwanda, Kenya, Ethiopia, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, and Burundi, we have lots of different traditions of storytelling, different topics that come to the fore, different conditions of production, right? So some people um, reside in refugee camps and depended, especially during the pandemic, more or less on their cell phones for writing up things. Um, other people have access to learning centers, have their own computers, have access to universities, so very different um, production conditions. And we wanted to really make that transparent. And so one of the ways in which we wanted to allow that is to have these letters to the reader where we invited the, con uh, the contributors and also did that ourselves to comment on how we, like where we come from vis-a-vis um, -vis the project, the book, the research, um, how we actually went about doing the research, what our impressions are, and also what would we like the reader to take away with. And I think this also leads to this other emphasis that we have in the book, which is on dialogue. Um, so we say to us, uh, research is a form of dialogue, multi-layered dialogue, right? It's the sort of um, researcher with in the whole oral history interviews with um, the other interviewees. It's the researcher with other archival and sources. It's the researcher with the other researchers in the course, um, with the professors, with the teaching assistants, with colleagues, and then ultimately with the audience. And in this case, the audience is the reader. So again, we thought by sort of addressing the reader and inviting them sort of into the conversation as much as we could, which was actually addressing them directly, um, would be a really nice idea. And of course, it would be fantastic to hear from many readers what they think about the book and see their side of the dialogue as well in the future. Yeah, thank you. And that invitation definitely makes the book more accessible. It makes you want to read more. Um, Kate, maybe would you like to expand more on this idea of accessibility and how the book is made accessible to wide audiences? Yeah, I think this is a great question. The question of, of audience and who the book is for, which is, I mean, in an ideal world, everyone. Um, but I think what one of the questions that we thought a lot about together was 
how to bring these stories that contributors had written, both you know, the stories of the people they interviewed and then also their interpretations and framing of those stories, how to bring those to a wider public. Um, and I think one of the way, one of the things the letters do at the start of each chapter is, is try to position the contributor and their contribution and how they would like to interact with the public that they're reaching. Um, so to explain some of their decisions, both in, in the questions they were asking, in the people they chose to interview, and then in how they framed those stories. So, so for instance, Muna, who's one of our contributors, writes about the process of translation of, of the interviews she did and her decision to leave really long sections of the interviewees, the narrators in her text, which is somewhat unconventional. Um, and actually something that some of our reviewers said, well, maybe, maybe you should cut down on the quotes and have more of, of the author's voice. Um, and, and she was really firm and said, no, it's really important to me that those voices are preserved intact the way that they framed their stories and to have those sort of fragments of their experiences preserved in, in the words that they chose to use and in the way that they chose to express them to me. Um, and, and so she was able to explain that also in the introduction to her chapter and say, this is why I made this decision. This is why it's so important to me to have these words in here. And yeah, so I think that this, this goal of making the construction of the text transparent is also in some way an invitation to readers to engage with that and think and, and ask perhaps their own questions of their context and what it would look like for them to, to engage in similar processes of inquiry and research in their own local environments. And I think we're really hoping um, that this book does serve as an invitation to, to students in particular, to student researchers, to people who maybe aren't sure that they're historians, but are interested in historical questions, to think about all of the different ways that, that they can engage with their local context as, as researchers, as historians, and to think about how their position in those contexts shapes the kinds of questions they ask and how they come to, to answer them. That was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so what are the biggest challenges in terms of writing this book, bringing together publishing process? There are a lot of contributors coming together as, um, as one, one voice in that book. What are your biggest challenges? Also employing unconventional methods using oral history. Sure, I think um, for me, it's actually a profound sense of tension that accompanied me through the entire process and continues to accompany me and uh, it can't be resolved. And as a person, I like to resolve things. So it's sitting with that tension and accepting the ambiguity that to me is the biggest challenge. And to me, that tension comes from, on the one hand, we're setting out to celebrate and make visible diversity and difference. And on the other hand, of course, we're being asked to conform to certain standards of a discipline called history. And we can't diverge too far from it because then we wouldn't be read as part of it anymore. We'd be too far. <laughs> so um, the tension is on the one hand, celebrating difference. And on the other hand, acknowledging that inclusion is predicated on exclusion. And I think that to me is something we can't resolve. It will always live with us in these discussions that we're having. Um, but I think it's also actually quite hopeful because we also don't want to end up with a past where there's just one correct answer about what happened, but we'd like to have an open past, an inclusive past as Isma said earlier. Um, and in the same way, I think that we need to accept contradictions in the past then we do also have to accept those contradictions in the process of making the past and the process of analyzing and, and writing uh, the past. So um, I think to me, what I really, really valued and what was my biggest joy in helping bring this book together is the dialogues that we had and the exchanges that we had from all these different places and life experiences. And it's definitely what I value the most. Um, and sometimes it broke my heart to have to say, well, the word count is supposed to be this. And then here we have to fiddle with the grammar. And here we have to like, you know, so <laughs> um, so that that's the tension, um, I think, that we're living with. Form is always ready to get you. Right? <laughs> uh, 
um, Kate, would you like to end on? Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with everything Marcia said and, and the challenge of sitting with that contradiction and just recognizing that it's a part of the work. Um, I guess I would speak specifically to the conclusion of the book, which we actually wrote all of us together. Um, so there's 11 co-authors of the conclusion. And thinking about, um, you know, in the book as a whole, it, it is bringing all of these voices together, but everyone kind of has their autonomy within their chapter. But then in the conclusion to say, okay, we're all going to write this together and um, taking all of those different perspectives. And, you know, we had disagreements. We had disagreements about who the audience of, of our work should be. We had disagreements about the best way to present it um, and disagreements about, you know, is it is it more important to publish historical scholarship for an academic audience or to think more widely about community facing scholarship and, and what's the avenue that we wanna pursue? And, you know, those things aren't mutually exclusive but it does involve a selection of priorities and of saying, okay, this is what we're gonna focus our collective energies on first. Um, and so I think those conversations that, that resulted in the conclusion that we all wrote together and thinking, okay, how do we represent in writing um, in a linear sort of narrative way, all of these tensions and points of agreement and points of disagreement, um, I think that for me was really challenging, but also really generative and, and really forced me to reflect really critically on my own practices of historical scholarship as someone who works, you know, mostly in a kind of very traditional way with archives and, and textual sources and, you know, writing as, as one author to think, okay, what does this really collaborative form of historical scholarship, what kinds of opportunities and challenges does that pose for thinking about history as a discipline? and for expanding, um, sort of pushing at the edges. You know, we're still inside history, as Marcia said, we're still trying to be included, but kind of pushing a little bit and saying, okay, what if we took this a step further? What could we um, see from this edge of, of history as a discipline um, that that challenges maybe some of our, our assumptions or understandings? Ismail, I'll pass to you. Thank you, thank you, Kate. Um, I totally agree with the contradiction part, um in the sense that the accounts of my interviews were contradicting to what i know so to, in my logic as someone who has rigid methodology in planning projects uh knowing that you know the um the gender awareness will evolve but looking at what their accounts is about what they have shared that no like the the gender awareness is is being decreased. There is there is a backlash in that. So come to terms with this. It made me it made me like you know just sit and listen to their accounts. Uh, another another part was it was really challenging to me is that you know I, when I started to develop the the project question and to construct the questions and the the topics that. It's, is it trying to to address? Uh, I came from a very um, uh, let's say like list of questions that need to be addressed. I didn't know that there are a lot of feelings and 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 experiences that in in a better in another world I would consider them as tribal like uh, details. Like one of my interviews said that she read a book. When, she was a teenager and this has led us to led, led her to question the gender roles inside her family question the discrimination that was taken for granted in her community something that i find a bit surprising and hard to convince me that it changed a lot but as her account was charged with with feelings and with experience and she reflected on that and she you know, she went on and on to talk about how this book changed her her perspective on gender roles. Like, it made me think that probably a lot of women in Syria or elsewhere in the Middle East have had the same experience. They read a book, and this changed uh, the way they perceive the world. Uh, I tried as much as possible to convey this, but I know it's it's really hard to translate it into English. And it's, it's even harder to uh, to uh, to convey it in words. 
you know, like uh, as much as possible, I try to to portray this. Um, I hope I have uh, succeeded in that. And, uh, you know, I, I tried so, you know, we we uh, we published the first version of the contribution in the blog. And then thanks to, to Marcia and, and Kate, we edited that a few times. I know, like, my English was broken. I, and I tried as much as possible to convey to be loyal to to the Arabic version. Um, at the end of the day, you know, like, um, it's hard to be 100% loyal to uh to their uh, uh to their oral accounts uh but um but i think like i i have had a good experience in that definitely and um translation language barriers functioning on second third languages is definitely integral part of that forced migration and i i really enjoyed your section um, so before we wrap up, I would like to ask one more question to each of you. Um, what final advice would you have for a young researcher with forced migration background, a researcher who would like to publish, conduct unconventional research? So just one final bit of advice. So I think... Um, I mean, I'm I'm not someone from a forced migration background, but I think what um, what I found really enriching and what I I hope helped all of the contributors in addition to me and Marcia was was building a community from the very beginning. Um, all of these research projects started in a context of collaboration, and everyone was able to decide what topic was most important to them to research, but it was in a context in which we were always in conversation with each other. We were always learning from each other, always providing feedback on each other's work, um, always saying, oh, you know, like I had a hard time with this interview or like I'm having a hard time finding ways to answer this question that I've chosen. Uh, does someone have any ideas? You know, so that process of of constantly exchanging ideas from the beginning all the way through, you know, okay, now we've decided to publish these things, um, talking about what that process looks like, reflecting together. And that was not only, I think, helpful for each of us in our own research work, but also when we came together to, to reflect on the process and to write about what that process looked like, it meant that we had a lot of material to work with and a lot of, um, shared experience to draw on and say, okay, these were the challenges that we faced individually. These were the challenges that came out of working together. Um, and just to have that support and that sense of, um, you know, research can be really lonely sometimes, especially when people are working, um, you know, outside of university context where there's not a big intellectual academic researcher community. And so to have that community, even if it's on WhatsApp, even if it's on Zoom, even if it's, you know, just email messages, you know, sent in the middle of the night for one person because we're in, you know, all different time zones. I think that was super important for all of us um, and something that I really treasure. Thank you. That was amazing. Marcia, would you like to give us a final bit of advice? The advice of the non-advice. Um, no, I mean, specifically, this book isn't really meant to be, you know, like a blueprint for how to do it. Um, but what I hope that this book does is spark people to question their own practices. So whatever it is that they're currently doing, whether they studied history at university and are sort of, as Kate said, engaged in more traditional historical practice, or whether they're outside of the academy and just really curious and interested about history and perhaps have experimented with writing their own history, I think to pay um, attention to, as we said earlier, to the conditions of production is really fantastic. And to sort of keep on questioning oneself is the way I'm currently doing it. The only way I could be doing it are the other ways of, you know, asking this question, are the other ways of um, approaching the archive, and just kind of being very reflective and self-reflective um, about one's own approach to history, I think is what, I would advise perhaps, and what I hope is the sort of um, inspiration that comes from, from reading the book. Yeah, thank you. Um, you have definitely inspired me. <laughs> uh, Ismail, over to you. I think like this experience 
experience was both humbling and thought-provoking at the same time. Uh, because um, and I would say like to anyone who's coming from migrant uh, background as myself, um, you know, like um, I've been thinking that I was framed as, as, a, as, as a migrant and uh, I, I, cannot, I cannot really act. I think like people who are, um, you know, who are, who do, who do not agree with the, uh, with the conditional or the conventional process of research, probably like to, to take a look at their, their, their history around them and to, to listen and try to document and um, try to, uh, you know, to, um, to mix, mix a lot of uh, methods together. Um, you know, like photos, um, pieces of uh, pieces of paper, uh, souvenirs, uh, all these things that you know they can they can uh, uh, they can be they can be worth to be to be keeping as as an archive, along with the living archive, meaning like us as human beings. Yeah, thank you all for okay. this amazing podcast. I really enjoyed it. Although the book is not meant to be a blueprint, it is definitely an amazing start to question the position of the historian, archives, academia in general. So thank you for that. Um, thank you for our session. Um, and I would like to close our recording now. Thank you all for listening. Bye-bye. <laughs>